May the words of my lips and the meditations of all our hearts be now and always acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Since the beginning, God has been making God's self known. The God we worship is over and over and over again a God of self-revelation. Here I am, says God, in the universal laws that underlie all of reality. Here I am, says God, in the chaos that allows for inexhaustible diversity of life within those limits. Here I am, says God, in the spinning of galaxies and in the birth of stars and in the unfolding of a single butterfly's newly transformed wings. Here I am. My godparent used to tell me that all of creation exists because of God's desire to be known, to be seen. Because God, who is love, lacked only one thing. In the fullness of the community of Father, Son, and Spirit, God needed something that was not God's self in order to love and to be loved by something other than God's self. And so here we are. And our response to God's self-revelation through the centuries has been to strive to know more. We write down the stories by which we have come to understand something about the nature of God. And we looked at creation and we said, look at this, this is God. And we looked at the wisdom that prompted the prophets to speak words of life and hope and comfort and challenge and we said, the source of this is God. And we looked at the life and death and resurrection and ascension of Jesus of Nazareth, and we said, this, this is God. And we experienced something within us, a voice that cried out within us, binding us to one another and connecting us to something beyond that we sensed was both intimately familiar and transcendently awesome. And we said, whatever this is, this is God. And over time, the stories that we recorded became holy scripture to us. Our way of reminding each other and teaching our children that this is God. And so although scripture never clearly defines God as a trinity, this has become a core part of what we understand about the nature of the God we worship, that there are three persons that we experience in three distinct ways that are all the same awesome power that we are trying to describe when we use the word God. God is at the very core of God's being, as far as we can tell, a community, a relationship, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, lover, beloved, and love, creator, redeemer, and sanctifier. It was just up the road from here, actually, at a Toronto clergy conference held at the University of Guelph that I overheard one of our savior priests say that whenever we sing holy, 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 the three persons of the Trinity look at one another and say to each other, ah, they're playing our song and they dance. It is easy to get into trouble on this Trinity Sunday trying to describe God, the precise nature of this divine dance. 
I'll leave that to someone else. But I do know this, that God is constantly making the divine self known, revealing God's self. And that the God that has been revealed to us is a particular kind of relational, community, connected God. And yet, when we think about how humans have struggled to understand the power that creates and directs our world, one of the things that humanity has often done is take what we think of as the best of humanity, the most right way to be human, and ascribed those characteristics to the gods. And so gods are mostly men, mostly in the prime of health, mostly strong, mostly resembling whatever humans are holding the power because that's what power looks like to our mind. And that is a dangerous game. So, so dangerous. I own over 100 nativity scenes I haven't counted for a few years. And despite my intentional attempt to correct this, in almost all of them, Jesus is depicted as white and frequently blonde. Not because that makes any sense at all for a carpenter's son from Nazareth, but because Western art sees whiteness and blondness as the best of humanity, the most right way to be human. And when we hold that up as what God looks like, we claim that some of humanity is made more in that image than the rest. And yet, when God became human, God lived among an oppressed people. God suffered and was executed and died under a system of domination that believed that Caesar was more God than man because he was the most powerful of men. And yet the one who created all things with the power to cause there to be something instead of nothing, the power to speak all things into being. What lies at the core and at the heart of God is not the might of God's power, but the interconnectedness of God's threefold community of being. God is constantly making the divine self known revealing God's self. And the fullness of God's self is so plentiful and so abundant and so rich and so diverse and full that the fullness of God cannot be contained in one person or in two. It takes three persons for us to even attempt to describe the God who has revealed the divine self to us. And in the image of that God, we are made, made for community, made for connection, made for relationship, made in rich and full diversity, all of us, with a spirit of adoption within us bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs and co-heirs with every other 
child of God. Rightfully, then, co-heirs alongside of indigenous children forcibly removed from their families and communities to residential schools. By rights, co-heirs with every man, woman, and child who bears the generational consequences of that sin. Our church did that. Not so long ago. These same scriptures that we turn to for words of love and hope and comfort were used to justify it. Because we believed that some of humanity was made more in God's image than others. That there was a better way to be a child of God and that it could not be learned in indigenous families from parents and elders. Because we believed that when those children cried out in their own languages, Abba, for their own fathers and mothers, for siblings and home, we believed somehow that the Spirit of God did not cry out with them, weeping for what was being done in God's own name. Woe is me, for I am lost. For I am a daughter of settlers and colonizers. I was raised to believe that the way things are is the way they should be and not to question it. And I've read the comments section. I know full well that I live among settlers and colonizers. It is a grievous mistake to think of God primarily as power. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, the prayer says. And so for us to be more godlike, we need to wield more power and someone to bend to our will and to create in our likeness. But that same prayer begins, Our Father, Abba, Dad. God is not at God's heart a power. God is at God's heart a relationship, a community, a family. And if we desire to be more godlike, to draw closer to the one in whose image we are made, to draw closer to the heart of God, then what we need is not greater power, it is more relationship, more community, a more encompassing sense of the fullness of the human family. And we have failed so badly and so often. How many 
prophetic voices through the ages have cried as Isaiah cried, Woe is me, for I am lost. For I see the sins of my people, and I recognize them in my own heart too. And yet somehow our hope is the same as Isaiah's hope. And yet my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. God has revealed God's self to us too. In the universal laws that underlie all of reality, in the chaos that allows for inexhaustible diversity of life within these limits, in the spinning of galaxies and in the birth of stars and in the unfolding of a single butterfly's newly transformed wings. In a life and death and resurrection that found nothing to fear in the power of Rome because it knew fully the power of love. In a voice that cries out within us even still, binding us to one another and connecting us to something that is both intimately familiar and transcendently awesome. Somehow our hope is the same hope as Isaiah's, to know our history, the truth of it, to know how that history remains deeply embedded in our current systems and structures. That truth is the hot coal that may burn from within us our own complacence with that persistent sin. And when every beloved child of God living on this land has clean water, has access to the language and the knowledge of their people, has resources for healing from the generational consequences of the doctrine of discovery, then we can say, as Isaiah said, our guilt has departed and our sin is blotted out. When every beloved child of God living on this land can find healing together, can share joy together, can marvel at and honor and preserve the wonders of creation together, with nothing to fear from the powers of this world because we know the power of love together and knowing ourselves to all be intimately bound one to another, can imagine a just future together. On that day, uh, the Holy One will say, oh, they're playing our song. And we will all dance together. Thanks be to God. <laughs>